Hello boys and girls and everyone out there in Facebook land. I hope you all are having a fantastic week. Um, I hope everyone, at least here in San Antonio with me, is staying cool and um, in the shade inside because it has been hot, 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 hot. Oh my goodness, the heat indexes are outrageous this week. But uh, I miss you all. And uh, I don't know. Are you ready? Let's do this. All right. So our children's sermon this Sunday is a, um, it's a continuation of the stories that we've been doing. This week we're going to be talking about two brothers named Jacob and Esau. And um, their story can be found throughout um, Genesis, starting in about chapter 25 and ending somewhere around chapter 33 as the two brothers together. And then you hear about them kind of separately. Um, Jacob and Esau are uh, the sons of Isaac, who is the son of Abraham. So if you've seen my past couple children's sermons, we did a children's sermon on Abraham on Father's Day. And then last week, um, July 7th, I did a children's sermon on Isaac. So this is just a continuation on that family story. We're going to be using um, an emergent reader from, let's see, the Barefoot Teacher and Teachers Pay Teachers. And actually, she has her own website, too, www.thebarefoottheacher.com, which I'll drop in the links for you. It's a wonderful little craft that um, would have been perfect for my lower elementary class here and even for our preschool class. And I'm going to be using it because, like I said, it's uh, a considerable amount of scripture that we're going to cover today because we're going to go over the whole story of Jacob and Esau, not just their birth or um, middle parts of it, but we're going to try to cover the whole thing. So are you guys all ready? Okay. So here's our little book here. Let me turn sideways so I can read it to you. So Jacob and Esau. Jacob and Esau were twins. Esau was born first. Esau was hairy and loved to hunt. His father Isaac loved him the most. Jacob was not hairy. He liked to stay home with his mom, Rebecca. She loved him the most. Since Esau was the oldest, he had a birthright. This means that he would one day be in charge of the family. One day, Jacob was home cooking some stew. Esau came home. He was very hungry. Esau said, I have been hunting and I'm so hungry. Please give me some stew. Jacob said, you can have some stew if you give me your birthright. And Esau gave it to him. Can you believe that? Isaac was old and blind. He told Esau, bring me some food and I will bless you. Rebekah heard Isaac. She told Jacob, put on first so Isaac will think you are Esau. Then you can get the blessing. So Jacob tricked his dad and got the blessing. Esau was very mad at Jacob. Many years later, Jacob asked Esau to forgive him. Esau did forgive Jacob. The end. So, like I said, this is an emergent reader book. So it's a very simplified story of... Um, Jacob and Esau and the things that occurred between them but um, I'm gonna give you some notes on it and then like I said we'll have some links for you in the comments there um, so the story of Jacob and Esau continues the story of Abraham if you remember in my children's sermon about Abraham on Father's Day we talked about how Abraham wanted to be a dad and his wife Sarah wanted to be a mom really really bad and they prayed and they prayed and they prayed and God promised them that one day their their descendants, their children, and the children of their children would outnumber the stars in the sky. But Abraham was a hundred years old before he had a child, before he had a son, Isaac. Sarah was 90. And then Isaac goes through a similar story. He gets married around the age of 40, and then his wife, Rebecca, can't have kids. And um, they wait about 20 years, and Isaac and Rebecca are praying and praying and praying, please let us have kids, we wanna have children. And the, the promise that God had given Abraham, God also gave Isaac. He said, I will give you children. They will outnumber the stars in the sky. That, that promise passed on. 
And finally, when Isaac was 60 years old, uh, Rebecca gave birth to twins. And in the story, if you read through the story in Genesis chapter 25, verses 19 through 34, that's where you can find the birth of Jacob and Esau. And I believe it's also the story of um, Esau giving away his birthright. Um, but the, Rebecca can feel the twins fighting in her belly. She can feel them fighting. And she, she, it bothers her so much that she asks God about it. She said, what's going on? And he has this incredible answer for her. And that's where the story of Jacob and Esau really starts. So they're very different siblings. Very, very different. And they fight each other in the womb, right? This reflects God's plan for them. Because you know what he tells Rebecca when she asks him, why are my babies fighting in my belly? He says, you have two nations growing inside of you. And they will be pit against each other. The older nation will serve the younger nation. So he's telling her that her boys, her, her kids that she's going to have, I don't know if she necessarily knows that they're two boys at the time, but they're probably not going to get along. And Rebecca and Isaac had this really difficult job of raising these two kids that they're told from the beginning aren't going to get along. And who knows if they were actually good parents or not. That's probably not our place to judge. It's probably God's because we're told that they each had a favorite, right? Isaac's favorite was Esau. And Rebecca's favorite was Jacob. Now, parents today will tell you, and, and psychologists and anyone and everyone who will listen or who knows anything about parenting will tell you it's not good to play favorites with your kids. It causes animosity. And you can see that happening in this story. However, I would argue that we're also talking about a story that has a very big part of God's plan, right? God has a big hand in this story. So it could be that Isaac and Rebecca were being molded by God and they were following his plan and that they were each nurturing a child for a specific thing. We see as they grow up in the scriptures, we see that um, they're very, very different. They take on different characteristics. We're told that Esau likes to hunt, right? He likes, to, that's his thing, he's outdoorsy. We're told that he's big and he's strong, he's covered in red hair. This, the scripture says his hair was so thick it felt like fur. So he's, he's kind of brawny. Um, and he's older, and he's stronger, and he's bigger, okay? And then there's Jacob. Jacob is smaller. We're told that he's hairless. Now, I don't know if he stayed hairless his, his whole life or not, um, but when they're born, he's, he's, he's um, hairless. He's younger, and he's weaker. That's why he does the indoor stuff. He stays around the house with his mom. He takes care of the running of the estate, as a woman would have. But he's also cunning, he's intelligent, he uses his brain. In fact, when they're born, when they're born, Esau's born first, but Jacob comes out holding on to his foot. He comes out holding on to his foot. So he didn't have to go through the journey by himself. He let his brother take the lead and he followed him out. That's pretty smart for an infant, right? So we know that, that Jacob is, is cunning in a way. We know that, um, they handle responsibility different, and we can see that um, in what they eventually do. So e Esau, we're told in the story, right? We told we were told in here that Esau had been out hunting one day, and he decides to trade his birthright for a bowl of soup. And um, there we go. There's that bowl of soup right there. He decides to trade his birthright for a bowl of soup. Boys and girls, a birthright is something that we don't really hear about that much. It's, it's a family's legacy. It would be wealth, money passed on from one generation to another to another. And that's how some of these, these older families that we have in different areas of the world have so much money. It's because they accumulate their wealth and it stays with one part of the family. Meaning when, um, let's see if, if you come from a really wealthy family and you have one parent alive and you have three siblings. There's four of you total, right? When that parent passes away, instead of the money or the estate or whatever is left over being divided equally among all four of you, you and your three siblings, it would be passed to the oldest child. And typically in most societies, it'd be passed to the oldest son. So all of that would be concentrated together to the next generation. And the rest of you, the rest of the siblings, would have to work their whole lives. They wouldn't get to take part of that, that wealth. Um, typically, they would work for the family, 
but you would be working nonetheless. You don't get to have the entire wealth of the family. So Esau has this, this amazing birthright. We don't know how wealthy Isaac was. We don't know, actually don't know how wealthy Abraham was, Isaac's father, right? Um, what we do know is that when Abraham went to find a wife for Isaac, which was my, my last children's summer in there, we're told that um, he sent 10 camels to the family of the, of the, um, the girl who was going to marry Isaac, Rebecca. So they say he sends 10 camels to Rebecca's family as a gift for her marrying Isaac. So that's a lot. That's a lot, right? It would be a lot today to have 10 camels to take care of. It was a lot in ancient times too. And if he had 10 camels, that makes me assume that he also had more camels after that. If he could just give away 10, he must have also had more at home. So Abraham had wealth, but I don't think the birthright that's being protected here is that, that monetary wealth, that physical wealth, is the dollars and the cents and the, the home and the land. I don't actually think that's what's being protected. Abraham's wealth and then Isaac's wealth came in the promise that God give, gave them. And God said, Abraham, your, your descendants will number more than the stars in the sky. You will be blessed. And he says that to Isaac, you will be blessed. That, that blessing passed on to Isaac. And Isaac has to choose which son it gets passed on to. And naturally, he's choosing the son that seems more fit, right? Esau's bigger. He's stronger. So he's more fit to take charge. But what Isaac doesn't count on is how much Jacob is willing to fight for that birthright. And we see this in this story. We said Jacob's cunning, right? He's sneaky. And he sneaks that birthright away from Esau. And we see both of them are very impatient. Jacob's not willing to wait for God's blessing to pass to him in time. He wants it now. Esau just got back from a hunt. He's hungry. He's thirsty. He wants, he wants food. He wants to rest. All of that stuff. And instead of taking that animal that he just hunted himself and and making a meal out of it, he demands food from Jacob. Now, Jacob could have been a good brother and just shared with him, but instead he sneaks away that birthright. And he says, sure, I'll give you soup if you give me the birthright. And Esau's impatient, right? He doesn't take 10 minutes, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever it might have taken for him to create a meal for himself or to go look for some food somewhere else in the house. He says, no, I need soup right now. Go ahead and take my birthright. So they're both very impatient. Um, and that's how the promise ends up passing on to Jacob. And from these two, these two brothers, we actually see God's promise fulfilled in both of them. Jacob's sons, Jacob has 12 sons eventually. They start the 12 tribes of Israel. The whole Israelite nation starts from Jacob's sons, which came from Isaac, which came from Abraham, right? So that fulfills God's promise. But also on Esau's side, Esau's sons, and I believe he had, um, I want to say six or ten of them. Don't quote me on that. You'd have to look it up in Genesis because I don't have my Bible open right in front of me right now. But Esau had a lot of sons, and they start several nations. They start the Edomites, the Amalekites, and the Tenemites, among others. That wasn't just it. Esau's sons became many, many nations. But what happens eventually in the fullness of time is that the Israelites rule over all of the nations that Esau's um, line created, all the Edomites and the Amalekites and the Tenemites. The Israelites rule over them all. So that warning that God gave that these two nations were growing inside Rebekah's belly and that they were going to battle each other and that one was going to serve the other, it came true. It didn't come true right away, right? It came true uh, down the road several, several years down the road, decades and decades, but it came true. And that blessing was passed to both boys. God's promise stays true. No matter what our plans are, no matter what we're doing, we could have a talk about predestination, but that's a really big word for small kids. We can have a talk about free will, but the ultimate truth of it is if God has a plan for us, it's going to happen. We can make it harder on ourselves. We can make it easier on ourselves, but we're going to follow that plan. Right? And the Bible gives us examples of this over and over and over again. So parents, there's so many different ways that we could take this story. 
that we could um, talk about. Uh, it's a great story for talking about deception and the consequences of lying, if that's something that is um, a problem in your household. It's a great story for talking about God's blessings and God's promises and how they don't always come true in the way that we want them to, or maybe that prayer doesn't come true in the way we want it to. It's a great story to use for um, looking at how people are individual, how their unique characteristics play into their story, how they play into God's plan, and how they don't, how they can conflict with each other. A lot of crafts for Jacob and Esau talk about the differences between the twins and being a twin mama myself, that's where my focus went when I was reading through this story. Um, what were the differences between the boys and what were the same things between the boys? Um, so I'm gonna say a quick prayer, boys and girls, and then I'll drop some links for you all um, for crafts and such, okay? Will you bow your heads, fold your hands, close your eyes? And say, Dear God, thank you for guiding our paths and leading us towards you, just like you did with Jacob and Esau. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, so like I said, if you like this little emergent reader um, book, coloring book and craft, um, you can find it from the Barefoot Teacher. I found it on Teachers Pay Teachers, and I'll drop that link for you in the comments. Uh, it was $3, and you go to supporting a teacher if you uh, purchase the craft. And then I also have um, a full lesson plan for you from truewaykids.com that is all about Esau and Isa uh, excuse me, Esau and Jacob and, and their battles together and that whole entire story of their lives. Um, it has a story for younger kids, um, activities. There's a, a beard craft and a soof craft. Um, there's... Uh, spot the difference worksheets matching games activities. There's also they have a God's story video on there from YouTube That's fantastic. It tells the entire story of Jacob and Esau in four minutes And I will post that link for you also from YouTube God's story video um, For my older kids we have a cal um, from Calvary curriculum.com. We have uh, word searches and fill in the ranks and crosswords for Jacob and Esau and then for all of my kiddos, um, from kidsinthebible.blogspot.com is a comparison craft where you can go through and compare the differences between Esau and, and Jacob. And like I said, there are many differences between them, but there are also similar things because remember, there are two Bible characters that we can look at that were raised at the same time in the same household in the same way, right? And they became two very different people. And the characteristics that are displayed in them, um, some of them are similar. They're both impatient, right? They're both, uh, to me, they sound like millennials and they sound like people of our, our generation, our time period. But um, they also have things that are very unique to each one of them. And that play into that, that plan for their lives that you can see come, tr um, come forward in the entire story of Genesis. Um, Parents, like I said, you can take this many different ways. If, if deception is something that you need to talk about in your family, I do recommend this story because you can look at the ways that um, Jacob's deception and, um, and cunning sort of broke apart their family even more. He and Esau had a rift in childhood when he, he demands the birthright for the bowl of soup. They have a rift in adulthood when um, Jacob pretends to be Esau and he steals the father's blessing, Isaac's blessing. And they end up spending 20 years apart before Esau finally forgives Jacob. Jacob comes home and Esau forgives him. And there's, there's big complications in their immediate family by that deception. And you could also say that there's complications in Jacob's entire life from the deception that he took part in. If you look at um, the 12 tribes of Israel, his 12 sons, and the way that they got in trouble, the things that they did that were wrong and against God's will, um, the way that they fought amongst themselves, the way that um, Jacob ends up losing his favorite son, Joseph, and he thinks that he's, he spends most of his, his life, uh, Joseph's life, thinking that he's dead. You know, there's a, there are a lot of consequences to Jacob's actions, just like there are consequences to our own actions. Um, if you have a kiddo that's, uh, that's needing help with seeing their individuality and how special they are, and God's plan, and I suggest you look at the, you know, how how each character is different because you can see big parts of their lives here, and you can compare 
compare them together. Um, if you need to look at how God's promises always come true, that's an overarching theme here. You can start with the story of Abraham. If you have a, a storybook Bible, it would be perfect for this. Start with the story of Abraham and go through the story of Jacob and then Joseph and his sons because there's this big arc that happens um, from God's blessing Abraham and then, and then it's it coming true in eventuality. And I think it's important for us to all remember that just because we're promised something doesn't mean it's going to happen in our way and in our time. Or just because we pray for something doesn't mean that it's going to happen in our way and in our time and in our logic, right? It's going to happen in God's way and in his time. And I just hope that um, everybody gets something out of this story. It's not a Bible story that has been prevalent in, in my life. I, I think I've read it a couple of times. I don't even remember doing a, a study on it when I was in Sunday school as a child, but it actually, there's a lot of undertones to it that you can take and you can, you can um, develop there. And I hope that you, um, each family has fun exploring it. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot of uh, announcements this week other than, than to watch for some um, notifications about worship changes and what things are going to look like when we all get to come back together again when the children's ministry gets to reopen finally and be back together. And I hope it's soon. But Miss Jessie's planning. I got some things working, and I am so excited to be able to announce them to you. Um, so stay tuned for that and in the next couple of weeks. But until I can see you all again, have a happy and safe and healthy quarantine. I miss you all.